In this video, we will continue to discuss dental caries. The caries lesion can be described as an imbalance between the demineralization and remineralization processes. Caries can be described according to location, clinical management strategy, rate of activity, occurrence and depth of the lesion. Let's look at the clinical classification of caries. According to location, caries can be pit and fissure caries, smooth surface caries and root caries. According to clinical management strategy, initial caries lesion or white spot lesion and cavitated caries lesion. Initial caries lesion is the one that has not been cavitated. In enamel caries, non-cavitated lesions are also referred to as white spot lesions. Most initial caries lesions can be arrested or remineralized without any restorative intervention. Then we have the cavitated caries lesion. This is a caries lesion that results in the breaking of the integrity of the tooth or a cavity. All cavitated lesions require restorative treatment. According to the rate of activity, it could be active, inactive or rampant. Active caries lesion is the one that is considered biologically active. A lesion in which tooth demineralization is in frank activity at the time of examination. Inactive caries lesion is biologically inactive at the time of examination, meaning Tooth demineralization caused by caries may have happened in the past but has stopped and is currently stalled. It's also referred to as arrested caries. Rampant caries is a term used to describe the presence of extensive and multiple cavitated and active caries lesions in the same person. According to the occurrence, caries could be primary, secondary or residual. Primary caries means the caries lesion is not adjacent to an existing restoration or crown. Secondary caries means that the caries lesion is adjacent to an existing restoration, crown or sealant. Residual caries refers to carious tissue that was not completely excavated before placing a restoration. According to the depth of the lesion, caries can be classified as enamel caries and dentin caries. Enamel caries means the caries lesion is limited to enamel, typically indicating that the lesion has not penetrated into dentin. But histologically, Many lesions detected clinically as enamel caries may have extended onto the dentin. Dentin caries is caries lesion extending into the dentin. Let's talk about enamel caries now. You all must have heard of the white spot lesion, correct? Well, let us take a look at it. An incipient lesion or a white spot lesion is the first clinical evidence of caries in enamel. It appears as a chalky white opaque area on the tooth surface. They are seen when the tooth is dry and seems to disappear when it is wet. This is an important distinction between incipient caries and hypocalcified enamel. Hypocalcified enamel is visible both when the tooth is dry and wet. It does not require any treatment unless there are aesthetic concerns. Coming back to the white spot lesion, it is characterized as reversible and the enamel surface is fairly hard, intact and smooth to the touch. These areas of enamel lose their translucency because of the extensive subsurface porosity caused by demineralization. These lesions usually are observed on the facial and lingual surfaces of teeth. It has also been shown experimentally and clinically that non-cavitated caries of enamel can remineralize if immediate corrective measures are taken to alter the oral environment, including plaque removal and fluoride therapy. An important point to be noted is that excessive probing of a white spot lesion may cause cavitation and then there is no option but to restore the tooth. Therefore, we must use the probe very carefully. Let's look at histological zones of caries. The established enamel caries lesion has four histologic zones when examined in quinoline by transmitted red light. Zone 1 is the surface zone. The surface zone is relatively unaffected by the caries attack. The intact surface over incipient caries serves as a barrier to further bacterial invasion. Hypermineralization and increased fluoride content of the superficial enamel are supposed to be responsible for the relative immunity of the enamel surface. Zone 2 is the body of lesion. The body of the lesion is the largest portion of the incipient lesion while in a demineralizing phase. The striae of red seers are well marked in the body of the lesion, indicating preferential mineral dissolution along these areas of relatively higher porosity. The first penetration of caries into enamel occurs via the striae of red seers. Bacteria may be present in this zone. Zone 3 is the dark zone. The next deepest zone is known as the dark zone 
because it does not transmit polarized light. Caries is an episodic disease with alternating phases of demineralization and remineralization. Experimental remineralization has shown increases in the size of the dark zone at the expense of the body of the lesion. The size of the dark zone is probably an indication of the amount of remineralization that has recently occurred. Zone 4 is the translucent zone. The translucent zone is the deepest zone and represents the advancing front of the enamel lesion. It has been called translucent because of its structureless appearance when perfused with quinoline solution and examined with polarized light. Let's talk about the progression of the caries lesion. The progression and morphology of the caries lesion depend on the site of origin and the conditions in the mouth. Three years after the eruption of the tooth is at the time when there is a peak incidence of new lesions. Occlusal pit and fissure lesions develop in less time than smooth surface caries lesions. The time for progression from a non-cavitated caries lesion to a cavitated caries lesion on smooth surfaces is estimated to be 18 months, give or take 6 months. As we are all aware of the anti-caries effect of saliva, conditions that affect saliva can hasten caries progression. For example, radiation-induced hyposalivation or dry mouth can lead to the development of caries lesions 3 months from the onset of the radiation. Caries lesion progression in healthy individuals is usually slow compared with the progression in compromised persons. Cavitated enamel caries is an irreversible lesion. Cavitated enamel lesions can be initially detected as subtle breakdown of the enamel surface. More advanced cavitated enamel lesions are more obviously detected as gross enamel breakdown. These lesions are very sensitive to probing and can be easily enlarged by using sharp explorers and excessive probing force. In cavitated caries, the enamel surface is broken and usually the lesion has advanced into dentin. Although some cavitated enamel lesions can be arrested and may not progress to larger lesions, most cavitated caries lesions require restorative treatment. Now that we have covered enamel caries, let's move on to the progression of caries in dentin. Dental caries advances more rapidly in dentin than in enamel because it provides much less resistance to acid attack as it has less mineralized content. Dentin possesses microscopic tubules. These act like tunnels that provide a pathway for bacteria to enter and for minerals to exit. When enamel demineralization advances to the dentinoenamel junction, rapid lateral expansion of the caries lesion along the DEJ may occur if there is bacterial contamination. The lateral spread of caries is because the DEJ has lower mineral content compared to primary dentin and because there is increased bacterial metabolic activity within the dentinal lesion. This is why dentinal caries looks V-shaped in cross-section with a wide base at the DEJ and the apex directed pulpally. The three levels of dentinal reaction to caries can be recognized as follows. Reaction to a long-term, low-level acid demineralization attack associated with a slowly advancing lesion. Sclerotic dentin. Reaction to a moderate intensity attack. Reparative dentin. Reaction to severe, rapidly advancing caries characterized by very high acid levels. Pulpal necrosis. What is sclerotic dentin? Initial stages of caries lesions or mild caries activity produce long-term, low-level acid demineralization of dentin. When there is danger outside our home, we try to protect ourselves by closing the doors. Similarly, dentin responds to this demineralization by deposition of crystalline material from the endotubular dentin in the lumen of the tubules. This was previously called affected dentin. The intertubular dentin with more mineral content than normal dentin is termed sclerotic dentin. The apparent function of sclerotic dentin is to wall off a lesion by blocking or sealing the tubules. The permeability of sclerotic dentin is greatly reduced compared with normal dentin because of the decrease in the tubule lumen diameter. Sclerotic dentin is usually shiny and darker in color but feels hard to the explorer tip and may be seen under an old restoration. Sclerotic dentin can be formed only if the tooth pulp is vital. The next level of dentinal response is to moderate intensity irritants by forming reparative dentin. Let's see how it forms. The carious dentin has a wide variety of pathological factors such as high acid levels, bacteria and their enzymes. These factors will cause pulp to get irritated and thus cause secondary odontoblasts to grow. These cells produce reparative dentin over the area of irritation to the pulp. 
The structure of reparative dentin is different from regular dentin. Depending on the intensity of the stimulus, it may vary from well-organized tubules to very irregularly organized tubules. Reparative dentin functions as a barrier that permits limited diffusion of material through the tubules. In this way, it helps in stopping further bacterial invasion and allows pulp to heal. Now, when the caries is rapidly advancing and there are very high acid levels in the lesion, the natural defenses of the pulp are overwhelmed and it leads to infection, abscess and ultimately death of the pulp. Localized infection in the pulp produces an inflammatory response which consists of capillary dilation, local edema and stagnation of blood flow in the area. As the pulp is confined in the pulp chamber and the blood supply is through the narrow root canals, this inflammation causes reduction of oxygen to the pulp, which leads to local necrosis. This local necrosis leads to further inflammation in the adjacent pulp, and a vicious cycle is started, which leads to necrosis of the entire pulp of the tooth infected. Histologically, dentinal caries has three zones. The distinction between these three zones is most clear in cases of slowly advancing caries. The first zone is the zone of hard dentin. It represents the deepest zone of the lesion, provided that the pulp is not infected. It includes normal dentin, sclerotic dentin, and reparative dentin. Clinically, this dentin is hard, it cannot be removed by an explorer, and a burr or a sharp cutting instrument is needed to remove it. The second zone is that of firm dentin. You may have heard the terms affected and infected dentin before. However, those are outdated concepts now, and we use the zones of dentin instead. Firm dentin was previously called affected dentin or inner carious dentin. Its main feature is the demineralization of intertubular dentin and the formation of intertubular crystals at the advancing front of the caries lesion. Clinically, firm dentin is not easily excavated by hand and pressure needs to be applied to remove it. It has a potential for remineralization. It can have a leathery texture. The third zone is called soft dentin or outer carious dentin. The main histologic feature of this zone is bacterial presence, low mineral content and denatured collagen. It is contaminated and necrotic. Clinically, it can be easily removed with a hand instrument. This zone needs to be removed during tooth preparation as it cannot be remineralized and its removal helps to prevent the further spread of the infection. The ideal excavation depth for caries removal is till firm dentin is reached as it is a natural barrier against bacteria and acids. It is possible to arrest caries. This happens when the lesion does not rapidly advance and the body's defenses stop further spread. They are remineralized lesions. They normally appear dark brown or black in color. The dentin in an arrested caries lesion is called abonated dentin. There is no need to restore these lesions unless there is an aesthetic consideration. That's all for this video. Let's have a quick recap of what was discussed. We learned the classification of caries according to location, clinical management strategy, rate of activity, occurrence, and depth of lesion. We looked at white spot lesions and their clinical significance. The four zones of enamel caries were discussed, namely the surface zone, the body of the lesion, the dark zone, and the translucent zone. When enamel demineralization advances to the dentino-enamel junction, Rapid lateral expansion of the caries lesion along the DEJ may occur if there is bacterial contamination. There are three levels of dentinal reaction to caries, sclerotic dentin, reparative dentin, and pulpal necrosis. Histologically, dentinal caries has three zones, zone of hard dentin, firm dentin, and soft dentin. The ideal excavation depth for caries removal is till firm dentin is reached, as it is a natural barrier against bacteria and acids. Arrested caries is the caries lesion that does not rapidly advance and the body's defenses stop further spread.